Welcome to the Hebrews Bible Study with Pastor Jason. I get the privilege of uh, serving as the lead pastor of the Compass Church. This is week two for those who have done it face-to-face. -face. And um, for those of you who are doing it online, this is part one of chapters two and three of the book of Hebrews. So we're just going to dig back right back in. I'm not going to try to go back and summarize the last videos or anything like that. You'll definitely need to watch those. If you have not read all of Hebrews chapter 2 before watching this video, make sure that you do that. I would suggest you read chapter 2 and chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have learned so that we do not drift away. So what, do you, what comes to mind when you hear this voice, or this voice, this verse? What comes to mind when you hear this verse? What visual do you get? Do you get a nautical visual? Do you get, um, you know, floating? I mean, what do you get? It's really interesting um, how this verse is laid out. And one of the interesting things about it is that he does, Paul does use a nautical term here in verse 1. The word for drift in the Greek is prosheen, P-R-O-S-E-C-H-E-I-N, which means to hold a ship towards port. So I think this gives us a very different sense of what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying is that if you miss the port, if you drift away, it is not an accident. It is because you were not careful enough. Be very careful, right? He, he tells us that. Be careful. That you should know better. You're trained better. A captain is highly trained, right? And so allowing the boat to get off course is because the captain was not diligent enough with their navigation. And so us allowing ourselves to get off course is because we're not diligent enough to what God is teaching us. So again, coming out of the gate to just begging, right? Verses two through four. For since the message spoken through the angels was binding, in every and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So um, it's, it's really cool here because, I, because what Paul is saying to us is that um, the message, right, the message that the angels brought, there was nothing wrong with it. God sent that message, and it brought people into a place of redemption. It brought people into a, a place of um, needing to be cleansed and needing to have their sins washed away and all those things. But it still was not the message of the Son, right? And it's interesting because when we even think about the message of the angel, angels is probably, you know, Calling back to the Old Testament, maybe um, common Jewish belief, like where the three people who, the, the three uh, men who appear to Abraham, they're angels. Uh, you'll find that in Genesis when, when Jacob wrestles with God, the Jewish belief was that he was wrestling with an angel. You know, those type of things, as the angel comes to Daniel, he gives him a message. So those type of things, those instances are really kind of um, what the message is, I think, that we see. You'll find these in, in Deuteronomy. And um, so one really good example of that actually is found in Deuteronomy 33, 1 through 5. So it says this, this is the blessing that Moses, the man of God, pronounced to the Israelites before his death. So this is the, we call this the song of Moses. And it says this. He said, the Lord came from Sinai and dawned over them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came with myriads of holy ones, so angels, myriads of holy ones, from the south and from the mountain slopes. Surely it is you who love the people. All the holy ones are in your hands. So again, the holy ones, this myriad, these are angels. At your feet, they all bow down and from you receive instruction. So God tells them what to do. The law that Moses gave us, the procession of the assembly of Jacob. He was king over Jeshurun when the leaders of the people assembled along with the tribes of Israel. 
So again, this Jewish tradition, it would have been interpreted that the angels were the ones who brought God's messages and the law to Moses. And because of this passage, um, you know, again, it was this common Jewish belief that it was the angels who delivered the law, the covenant, all those things, right? So let's jump forward a couple thousand years, again, with this idea of angels bringing a message. And in Luke 2, Verses 8 through 14 says, Where the shepherds were lying, living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over the flocks at night, the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord showed around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I will bring good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be the sign. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of all the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those whom his favor rests. So see how Paul is contrasting uh, and comparing the message given by the angels. The covenant to Jesus fulfilling the covenant. This is going to be a powerful thing because Paul is going to argue later on that Jesus fulfilled all of it. So the law, the covenant from Moses and then the coming of Jesus was both proclaimed by angels. And Jesus is greater than the proclamation. And, by the way, he fulfilled all of it. And so um, that's important. It's important because Paul is going to argue, and this is a very, very good valid argument, that the law was meant to bring us an understanding of right and wrong. It was never meant to save us. It was never meant to make us righteous. Only Jesus can make us righteous. Only Jesus can put us back in a relationship with God. Okay? All right, let's, let's jump down to verse 6. But there is a place where someone has testified. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? The Son of Man that you care for him. I don't know why um, Paul says it this way, because I'm sure he knows where it was written. It's written in Job 7, 17 and Psalm 144.3. They both, both of those say that. Um, so anyway, that's that's a quote from either of those. Okay, let's look at Hebrew chapter or chapter two, verse seven. You made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor. Okay, so in this verse, um, and in so many other verses leading up to this, right? The author spends so Paul spends a lot of time talking about how Jesus is greater than. And here, again, quoting from Psalms, he'll, he'll do this a lot. He's quoting from Psalms 8, 4 through 6. And it says, What is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You have made them rulers over the works of your hands and put everything under their feet. Right, so the struggle here is, is this dual nature of Jesus. So we've been talking about this in every video. Jesus is, the man Jesus was 30 years old, 30 years of, fre of flesh and blood. Born in 3 AD, died in 33 AD. But the Son of God, co-eternal, um, the Christ, is, is, has been around forever. And yet they can't be pulled apart. Jesus was fully man and fully God. And he was resurrected into the fullness of both of those, right? And it's just hard for us to, to get it. Like, how, how is it possible? And because of that, like, all throughout history, the early church has struggled with this. And because of it, there was a lot of really bad theology, theology that came about. Now, I'm not going to go through these at all, but it, download the class handout if you haven't done that. You should, I think it is a very important thing to have with you as you're doing the study. But I've listed a whole bunch of heresies. Now, what does heresy mean? Heresy means that it's a belief contrary to orthodox teaching. And orthodox literally means right doctrine or right belief, right? So um, there, there are a lot of uh, theological heresies around the dual nature of Jesus in an attempt to try to uh, explain who he is. The Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, if you ever quoted the Nicene Creed, that's really what they dealt with. They dealt with all of these, um, one specific um, heresy around the nature of Christ. It was called Arianism. 
But all throughout history, I mean, way past the Council of Nicaea, we have all these heresies all the way up to the seventh, eighth century. And so, um, again, just I, they're listed in there for you. You can spend some time looking at it. But what the real thing I want you to know is, is that this has been a struggle for humans to understand how Jesus can be fully man and fully God all at the same time. And it's just tough. It's just a really, really hard thing. Okay, so um, let's move on to verse 9. Verse 9 says this, But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. This is the sufficient, or the, or this is the suffering servant that is found in Isaiah 53, right? So, so Paul is going back to Isaiah 53 and saying, you know, that suffering servant that we see as a messianic prophecy, Jesus is fulfilling that. He is the one who, who does it and, and does all the work of it. And so we see him saying again, greater than the prophets, greater than the angels. And by the way, this is the servant that the prophet Isaiah was talking about. Okay, so verses 10 through 12. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should be should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. So this is Paul explaining God's choice to allow Jesus to suffer. Um, again, not that Jesus had to suffer, but an explanation of God's choice for him to suffer. But the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So this adoption language is going to be important for us to, to understand this. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I declare your name to be my brother and sisters in the assembly. I will sing your praises. So this is a really important section. Because remember the law. If, if you go back and read the, the law in the Old Testament, it was only for Jewish, Jewish people. And Paul will argue that the Gentiles, you and I, have been adopted into the family of God. That Jesus makes us holy. He brings about that ultimate access to God through his sacrifice. One sacrifice, not multiple sacrifices, not over and over and over again. And also, in, in, I think this, you know, the rest of chapter 2, is a clear indication that Paul had also written Hebrews because of the adoption language. Almost all of Paul's writing has this adoption, adopted into the family of God. You find it in Ephesians and Romans and Galatians. They all, they all have this really strong adoption language where we are brought into the family of God. Okay, verses 17 through 18. For this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Okay, now we're going to start to see another shift where Paul is going to start to argue that Jesus is a high priest, a faithful high priest. That, and he's going to talk about who the, who the high priests are, what they do, what their role is, how Jesus has fulfilled all of that, right? And so what this is telling us is there, uh, this, we have this adoption language that all of humanity is brought into this. Now we get this priest language. And um, it's fascinating because I think we get an image when we hear the word priest. Like a lot of us will get a Catholic image and those type of things. But priest, and, and it, you know, it makes sense, right? Because priest comes from the Latin word um, pontiff. Pontifex, P-O-N-I-F-E-X, it's where we get the word pontiff, but it really means bridge builder, that there is this idea that the priest is, is, is building a bridge that is between us and God. There's a gap that we as humans can't cross, and the priest is helping us to build that bridge. Paul is saying that Jesus is the ultimate bridge, that Jesus has bridged that gap between God and humanity that was created by sin. And so um, Leviticus 16 really lays out all the expectations for a priest, how they're to make atonement for the people's sins, um, what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to dress, and all those things. And so Paul is referring um, to that, but he's also saying there is a specific instance, right, when Jesus 
does away with that. There is a there is a specific instance in humanity where Jesus fulfills the priesthood, and that is found in Matthew 27, 50 through 51. And it says this, And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. And so the significance here is that um, the role of the priest was to go into the temple. That, that curtain separated the holy of holies, the innermost dwelling place. And so it was when God gave Moses the directions for the tabernacle and the tent of meeting way back in Exodus. He said, build it this way with the innermost place separated by curtain. When he gave directions to Solomon to build the temple, he said, build the Holy of Holies, set apart stuff to only be used in there. In Leviticus 16, when he tells Aaron to come in to the Holy of Holies, he says, you only come once a year. You don't just come when you want to, and you have to be covered with blood, and it's to make an atonement for people's sins. So all of that was very significant. When Jesus died, when Jesus gave his life for us, the scripture says that that temple curtain was torn in two. The Holy of Holies was no longer separated. Now, the Holy of Holies is you and I. The Holy Spirit lives in us. God lived there. That was his foothold in the world before. Now his foothold in the world is you and I. And that is significant, right? Because for a Jewish person hearing this message, they'd have been like, oh my gosh, I mean, that, that kind of makes some sense, right? That is Hebrews chapter 2. This video has been a little bit longer. I've been trying to keep only to 15 minutes. I just can't quite do it. I apologize. So next um, part of this video will be chapter 3.